Ladies and gentlemen, the next session is class actions, the way of the future. There is no doubt that the speakers we've got today, including the newly appointed Justice Jonathan Beach, um, are exemplary of the kind of experience we have in Victoria and why all major class actions should be held in Victoria. I'm told today there are 15,000 Jehovah's Witnesses next door. There's 75 in the city. Um, I thought that perhaps Tim Tobin might be passing out his business cards. Can I ask you to welcome the Honourable Justice Jack Forrest, the Honourable Justice Jonathan Beach, Ross Ray QC, Wendy Harris QC, Nicole Wern, Ken Adams, Brooke de Velida, and Tim Tobin, who will be hosting them. Thank you. Thanks, Will. In 2000, the Victorian Supreme Court Act was amended so that Part 4A was introduced. That was basically the mirror of the Federal Court Act amendments in 1992 to introduce 4A into that Act. Before 2009, in Victoria, the class action horizon was big, but mainly in relation to share class actions or medical products. There was a little bit done in the sense of tort, such as the uh, Legionnaire's case at the Aquarium. On Black Saturday, February 2009, this state was affected by catastrophic fires. That led to the issue of six group proceedings or class actions in relation to those fires. In order of which they have been heard or are to be heard, there was firstly the Horsham action, which was heard before his honour, Judge Jack Forrest, in 2011, going for approximately seven weeks. That was settled, save for some issues as to damages, and his honour made a ruling on that, which then went to the, full, or the, the Court of Appeal, and that ruling was approved, of course, like everything else his honour has done, by the Court of Appeal, and you can read that judgment in Power, Core and Thomas, which is reported at 2012 VSCA 87. The primary judgment is uh, his honours judgment, which gives you greater insight into that. After the settlement of that trial, there was then the Coleraine fire, which settled before trial, but even though it settled before trial, it had already had a trip to the Court of Appeal on the issue of the production of certain documents, and you can read the judgment in that in Power, Corps and Perry at 2011 Victorian Supreme Court 239. The Beechworth trial was next to occur and that was settled on the first day of the trial and that was against a number of parties. After Beechworth, there was the Weirai trial, which was basically the fires near Colac. And His Honour had the privilege in that case of sitting from the 3rd of September until mid-November, there's a little bit of a gap before the final submissions, um, and running the case to its conclusion, and the parties kindly to his honour did not do anything about it for the next six weeks, with he to deliver judgment on the 19th of December. Once we were sure that he'd written the judgment, we then settled it on the 17th of December. Um, and we saved his honour plenty of money because he didn't go to the race as much for that whole spring season. <laughs> Each of those proceedings were held in circuit courts and the Victorian Supreme Court was conscious of the fact that there was a need for these cases to go to the country where the people were injured or had suffered their damage. The next case was King Lake, or Kilmore East King Lake. That was heard beginning last year in the March through to the June, again presided over by His Honour, running for in excess of 200 sitting days with a purpose-built court. And His Honour had great involvement in the construction of that court and it was a magnificent structure. 
but it also gave us the capacity that each of the plaintiffs in that case, by entering a word that they were given, a code word, that they could watch the trial live and see everything that occurred in that trial, including, because of the uh, techniques in that trial, every document that was tendered. That trial finished in June. The proceeding has been settled, subject to the approval of the court next month. And the sixth case issued out of the Black Saturday fires is the Murrindindi fire, which is to be heard in February. Today's session is aimed at providing you with some insights and learnings from those people have been involved in various roles in these cases. We are privileged to have his honour judge, Jack Forrest, who was involved in the hearing of four of those actions, each of those actions apart from Beechworth he presided over. We're also privileged to have his honour Justice Jonathan Beach of the federal court who was Beach QC throughout the trial until one week before its conclusion in June. We have also here, with not the entitlement to being privileged, the solicitors and barristers have played particular roles. Mr. Ken Hand, uh, Mr. Uh, Ken Adams, sorry, of um, Herbert Smith Freehills, probably the preeminent defence um, solicitor for class actions in this state and who has been acting on behalf of SPI. Ms Nicole Wern, a partner from Norton Rose Fulbright, who acted for the state and had the task of coordinating about 12 barristers and about four departments of the state and who has also been extensively involved in the recent hepatitis C class action um, and also Brooke Delavadova from Morris Blackburn, the solicitors who acted on behalf of the victims in King Lake and who are acting on behalf of the victims in Murrindindi. We also have with us Mr Ross Ray, who was counsel for the second defendant, the inspection company, who carried out a magnificent role in the trial. He was making himself a small target and it is difficult for a barrister to sit for 200 days and learn different ways of saying no questions, Your Honour, uh, to make sure they remained a small target. He did that with great aplomb. Wendy Harris, unfortunately, is unwell today and cannot attend. She was the silk, or one of the four silks for the state of Victoria. Each of the people who are to speak are speaking from a different perspective and we hope it is in some way controlled I now call upon his honour, uh, Mr. Uh, Justice Jack Forrest. Thank you. When I look across um, to the table, I'm reminded of the Blues Brothers. It looks as though we put the band back together. <laughs> um, it was the Ides of March 2010, I'm relatively sure, when I was summoned to the chambers of the Chief Justice to discuss, as Her Honour put it succinctly, some interesting common law cases. I should have known better. I should have been stuck in the practice court for two months. I should have gone on circuit to Mildura for two years. By the end of our discussion, I'd accepted her kind offer. I think it was an offer, it may not have been. Um, but I ended up managing the Black Saturday bushfire trials, and Tim's given you um, an insight into what those have involved. It meant travelling around Victoria, it meant sitting at uh, a number of Victorian regional towns, but by far the most difficult of the cases that I was to encounter was the Kilmore East King Lake trial. As Tim said, it was a massive case. Some 119 Victorians lost their lives tragically, and there was extraordinarily extensive property damage. So. I want to talk very briefly to the court's perspective and how we dealt with, uh, as best we could, the challenges that we faced in the trial. Our first challenge, as Tim's already mentioned, was we didn't have a court. We didn't have a, a county court could not accommodate us. We could not get uh, access to the federal court, although with Justice Beach here now, we might be a chance next time. 
We could not find a court to hold the trial. Fortunately, um, the Attorney General, with some pushing, came to the party and provided a, uh, a courtroom that was extraordinarily um, suited for the conduct of a major piece of litigation in this state. Uh, it took four months to build. It, and that was an exceptional task because it was built over the course of the Christmas holidays. Uh, construction started in mid-November 2012. It had public seating for 100 people. It could accommodate up to 30 counsel and instructing solicitors. It had a witness box set up both for individual witnesses and for concurrent evidence sessions. And it had web streaming facilities, so the trial itself was then broadcast on the internet, uh, opening and closing submissions to the public at large, and the trial itself to group members and interested parties. So we were able to get the trial started relatively on time. During the background, we had our second challenge, and that was pre-trial management of the case. It was important to have the pleadings settled as best we could before the case started. It would have been an impossible task to run the case without pleadings being in a final um, state. There had to be some boundary markers for the course of the case. We held case conferences and directions hearings. We had e-filing, so there were no paper documents at all. We used a beta Redcrest system, which a lot of you will know is now in, uh, in operation in the um, commercial court. We didn't have witness statements, which was interesting. I, I was against witness statements because it was a common law trial. Um, some of the commercial barristers required persuasion, as did the commercial solicitors, but I think at the end it worked out, it worked out satisfactorily. Um, it would have been a very difficult trial to run with witness statements, uh, perhaps not impossible, but I, being the one who had to make the decision at the end, thought I was best assisted by hearing the evidence both in chief and in cross-examination, obviously, from the witness and the witness producing the documents. The two major issues, though, we faced were that, of were that of discovery and managing expert evidence. Expert evidence, Jonathan is going to talk about at some, um, in some detail, so I won't traverse that. But it, it required us to have conclaves, it required us to use associate justices, particularly Associate Justice Zammett, to assist with the management of the experts. The expert evidence itself was given ultimately in a concurrent evidence session in most cases. And by the end of it, I think we had something like a dozen different groups of experts. The second task was discovery. Again, it was not paper discovery. There was something like 20,000 documents which were the subject of electronic discovery. That was managed by the use of uh, court books and by the cooperation of the parties. Now, I spoke earlier today about the Civil Procedure Act. The Civil Procedure Act was complied with um, effectively to the letter by the parties. They cooperated in terms of the discovery and they cooperated in terms of the production of the electronic court book. So by <coughs> uh, February of last year, we were ready to go to trial. Um, just to give you some details as to the complexity of the trial, there were 26 counsel, hundreds of solicitors, I suspect, and paralegals, and me on the other side, I had five court staff and myself to battle them. But um, at times I won, but at times they won. We had 208 days of trial, we had 21,000 pages of transcript, we had 60 lay witnesses and 40 expert witnesses, and we had 10,400 electronic documents tendered. There were over 5,000 pages of opening and closing submissions. So it was in that context that the parties, um, in my view, conducted the litigation in exemplary fashion. Rarely was I faced with a dispute that wasn't merited, and rarely was I faced with an absence of evidence. We rarely had to stop the case. We had evidence virtually continuously throughout that period except when I fell ill um, to the Alistair Clarkson disease, Guillain-Barre disease, but I want to tell you I got back to work earlier than him. <laughs> um, the question of documents, as I've, as I've mentioned earlier, we had no paper documents, 
We had no trolleys in court, although at times when I snuck into court after hours, I realised there were breaches, and I was hard on that. Um, all documents were produced digitally. Council, after a short period of time, notwithstanding their age and proclivities and disposition towards the electronic uh, production of documents, seemed to get used to it, and I include Mr Richter in that. Um, it worked extraordinarily well. I'd already been sold on it by, the, by the, my experience in the regional centres, and I was a complete convert by the time we'd started this trial. Um, to maximise the way in which we operated the case, we uh, had interlocutory fights referred out to associate justices who I work closely with in terms of referrals. Expert evidence, as I've said, was managed essentially on a concurrent evidence basis, and you'll hear from Jonathan in a moment about that. We developed um, tender protocols, trial protocols. Uh, we had a running transcript. We had witness lists produced at the start of each week. We had a time trial timetable that we updated each week. Um, it was a Herculean performance, and primarily due uh, to the efforts of the solicitors and barristers involved in the case. Um, from a procedural point of view, it could not have run any smoother. Um, I think the most satisfactory thing I achieved was putting limits on opening and closing submissions, and that's perhaps an appropriate time for me to finish. Thank you very much. I must say, when I was asked to first speak at this conference, I felt a little schizophrenic. I wondered whether I should speak as a retired common law silk whether I should bring my skill set to bear from my new day job. I've decided to talk about an issue that has interested me in both capacities, and that's the question of expert evidence. Now, some judges have been heard to remark that class actions is just another procedural mechanism and that there's nothing new under the sun in terms of the legal or forensic dimensions involved as compared with individual actions. That's only partly true. You'd all appreciate that class actions have the benefit of producing economies of scale and aggregating hundreds, if not thousands, of claims to produce uh, total claims in the hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. What uh, occurs as a consequence of that is that it becomes economic for new forensic and technical uh, developments to occur. And you can see that in shareholder class <laughs> actions. Some of you in the room will be aware that there is linear regression analyses done in terms of event studies uh, that have been used as a developed tool involving expert evidence in shareholder class actions. Uh, if you just had an individual claimant claiming $50,000, those sorts of techniques and expertise would never get developed. But in the context of class actions, when you were talking about uh, claims of more than a billion dollars, it became economic to develop such techniques. Likewise, in mass tort claims, you might have a situation, for example, our Kilmore uh, class action, where it became necessary to actually carry out new tests and experiments that the electricity industry had never carried out in the past and to develop new scientific theories and apply them to the case. Again, if it was just an individual claim, you would never have the economics of scale or scope to justify the development of uh, such uh, new uh, experimental uh, theories and the expert evidence that followed. And that's really why uh, expert evidence uh, is uh, something that is uh, front and centre in class actions. You have more of it, uh, you have parties not only developing uh, such evidence in terms of subject matter, but also uh, calling upon more uh, expert expertise, not just from Australia, but overseas. And it's all because the economics of the uh, cases uh, require it and uh, it can be justified. Now, let me just uh, talk about a few issues uh, dealing with uh, the question of expert evidence and possible approaches. A judge faced with the situation of uh, a wealth or bank of expert evidence might decide that it's all too difficult and 
perhaps consider whether or not the uh, expert evidence phase should be shuffled off to a special referee. And that was uh, one matter that uh, Justice Forrest had to address in our case. But uh, usually for class actions, uh, it uh, is undesirable to uh, send out uh, banks or tranches of evidence to special referees because it involves uh, considerable fragmentation of the process. Normally for a class action, your first stage trial, you want to get on and deal with the common issues and then get a judgment out. So you don't want to think that for some particular aspect of breach or causation, uh, you want to send it out to a special referee because that just uh, fragments the proceedings. The other problem with special referees is that if you uh, send out uh, something to a special referee and uh, one or either of the parties don't like the report that comes back, then there's going to be the inevitable challenge that the trial judge would have to deal with anyway. And the fact of the matter is with the econo economics of class actions, uh, all points are taken uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, no uh, prisoners uh, left at the end of the day. Uh, so even with a special referee determination, it's likely that one side will be unhappy and normally that would uh, then involve coming back to the trial judge in any event and therefore it becomes uh, a bit of a wasted exercise. The uh, third problem with special referees is that sometimes in terms of breach and causation, you don't get a clean demarcation of issues either as to subject matter or as to uh, evidence. Sometimes a particular issue might involve both lay and expert evidence. You normally want the judge to deal with the yeah. lay evidence, of course, so uh, if you've got a, an issue that requires both, then you can't send out the expert evidence solely to a special referee because you need the one decision maker to hear both types of evidence. Uh, it won't surprise you all to hear that, uh, so far as I'm concerned, uh, you'd go for the judge every time over a, a special referee. The second issue that arises uh, for a judge if uh, he or she is dealing with the expert evidence is to uh, consider the question of sitting with assessors. And that's what uh, Justice Forrest did in the Kilmore class action. Uh, it wasn't just one assessor, we had two assessors. We had a, a professor of uh, metallurgical and mechanical engineering from Oxford and also one from New South Wales. Now, it's an obvious idea to have assessors, particularly where you have a judge who knows nothing about the technical issues or the science. And even if you have a judge who is a bit of a smart ass and thinks he knows a bit about the science, nevertheless it's usually uh, knowledge that's about 30 years out of date. So even that sort of a judge uh, can benefit from uh, sitting with assessors. Now of course assessors is a very uh, expensive uh, process uh, to use, as you can imagine, with our concurrent evidence session on the question of the fracture mechanics of the conductor <coughs> in the Kilmore class action. We had four weeks of concurrent evidence sessions, uh, and it became a, a very expensive exercise to have uh, two assessors come up the learning curve and then to sit in court. But again, it's the economics of class actions where the issue is important enough, and uh, a lot of money is riding on it. Uh, although in absolute dollars it's an expensive exercise, in a relative sense uh, it's quite uh, inexpensive but for class actions. I must say I am a fan of uh, assessors. They're useful to inform the judge about issues uh, pre-trial, uh, during the trial and also uh, post-trial, subject of course to providing procedural fairness to the parties by letting the parties know precisely what the assessors may have said to the judge uh, that the parties may need to know about and then deal with. Um, the second matter is that the assessors are very useful because if you have a concurrent evidence session uh, with lots of experts who are usually partisan uh, for all the obvious reasons, despite the best efforts of uh, the, uh, the, the parties and, and the judge, uh, what's useful about assessors is that they can keep the experts honest in terms of their opinions. So some of the experts uh, in uh, our concurrent evidence session, as I say, they were faced with two professors necessarily that imposed a disciplining effect on their behaviour. The third aspect about assessors is that they can focus the debate and indeed add new dimensions to the debate, perhaps by questions that counsel might have overlooked. 
Now, judges are usually blessed with very fine counsel appearing before them, but occasionally uh, deficiencies do arise. I might say when I was looking at the question of assessors, I did some research into their development and they were usually uh, used by courts of admiralty in the United Kingdom. And what was interesting is that judges would sit with nautical assessors who would talk about seamanship involving collisions and salvage and the like, and the judges would in fact actually bar counsel from calling any experts. And the judges used to just inform themselves from the assessors. Uh, given that Justice Forrest is um, pretty keen on the Civil Procedure Act, as I understand. Uh, <laughs> it may be that there is some power within the Civil Procedure Act that's uh, yet to be uh, fully appreciated in terms of its dimensions. Uh, might have a back to the future scenario, perhaps, who knows? <coughs> the next issue I wanted to briefly talk about was the number of experts used in class actions. It's always talked about as the flavour of the month to limit the absolute number of experts. Um, I don't think that's sensible. What should be done by a trial judge is not to limit the absolute number, but just to uh, limit the numbers in a way to avoid duplication. Take our uh, conductor failure mechanism in Kilmore. There were four or five different branches of science, including metallurgy, finite element modelling, mechanical engineering, uh, process engineering, and all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful uh, subject areas. And it wouldn't have been sensible to say, well, you call one expert on the conductor break and you, the other side, have one expert. Uh, you would need uh, an expert in each uh, particular uh, category. But it does make sense, of course, to um, keep the numbers down by avoiding duplication. There has been some suggestions, perhaps in class actions, of using court-appointed experts. I must say, for my part, I have a, a difficulty with that. Usually a court-appointed expert might be used where you've got a medical issue and it's a very simple case, the science is pretty clear. It might be sensible to have a court-appointed expert. But in a class action where the forensic issues are complex and you have different uh, subject areas, it really makes no sense to talk about just one uh, court-appointed expert. And it's also seductive to talk about a court-appointed expert as if they were independent or, or impartial, but they are usually not. Um, all scientists, whether experts called by the parties or even a court-appointed expert, come with their own biases in relation to particular theories. A court-appointed expert would only be called to give opinion evidence on an, on an area which was debated by the parties, but usually for such an expert to be useful, they'd need to be at the cutting edge of the particular science, and if they're at the cutting edge of the particular science, they usually have a particular view one way or the other. So, Although it's a good idea in theory to talk about court-appointed experts, I can't see the utility in class actions. Let me uh, finally talk about the process of dealing with experts in class actions. Now, we know that concurrent evidence, or what's um, been described as hot tubs, are the flavour of the month. Now, I, I should start by uh, making a confession. Uh, as counsel, the idea of giving up control of any part of the forensic process to the judge was an anathema to me, and I didn't like concurrent evidence sessions at all. Uh, I should now say that as a judge, uh, I've changed my mind. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of concurrent evidence sessions, there need to be steps taken prior to such a session. The first is that the experts have to meet in what's described as a conclave, and then to produce a joint report. Now, a joint expert report is very useful at a number of levels. <clears throat> First, it forces all experts to rethink their uh, position, because if they're in conclave, sitting down, trying to work out uh, a joint position or areas of agreement or disagreement, then if they're sitting around a table, they used to, used, usually have to justify to each other why they're disagreeing. So the very process of putting them in the same room and getting them to try and undertake the task of uh, producing a joint report is a good disciplining uh, influence on their behaviour. The second aspect of joint reports is that it narrows the issue considerably for the judge and helps the judge through thousands of pages of experts' reports to actually uh, hone in on the real technical issues. The third is that the joint report is very useful for counsel. Uh, I and Andrew Keogh 
participated in uh, most of these science and technical areas. And what was useful about joint reports was that that was the platform or the template from which I would start my preparation for cross-examination. Uh, so it does provide that uh, focus to the benefit of those who have to um, participate in cross-examining the experts. The fourth aspect is that it limits the uh, time for the concurrent evidence uh, session. Now, as to concurrent evidence, this is obviously much trickier uh, for counsel than the plain vanilla types of cross-examination uh, strategies that are used. You obviously have to rely not just on your charm and good looks, but you have to uh, be very flexible because the process is very dynamic. But I must say, after the Kilmore class action that I'm now in favour of, of this uh, technique, again, if you call all the experts together, it disciplines all of their behaviours. They don't try to get away with as much as they might otherwise, uh, because their peers are there to correct them. Another advantage for counsel is that uh, if you're going along happily in cross-examination and you're oblivious to the fact that you've missed a key point, or you've stuffed something up, at least you've got your own expert there to pick up the pieces uh, a little bit later. And the third point that I found that was quite interesting about these concurrent evidence sessions is that the judge was more likely to engage with uh, the uh, uh, process and otherwise, and for the judge to then engage in the process told counsel a lot about the uh, state of mind of, of the judge, and I won't elaborate further at, uh, in this forum on that. Um, <laughs> Finally, uh, let me finish by extending an invitation to our chairman, uh, Tim Tobin. Uh, as most of you know, Tim and I were opposed for 208 days in this Kilmore class action, and Tim was never shy about disagreeing with me every hour of every day. So, Tim, um, I invite you to disagree with me again now. Don't feel any reticence in what I, I've just said. If you disagree, please say so. I'd just like to correct... Sorry. We on here? Just like to correct some matter that His Honour did say. He likes to classify himself as a retired common law silk. He was not a member of the common law bar. He did one <laughs> trial. So he's a retired commercial silk. I now call upon Mr. <laughs> <laughs> he's good though. Uh, call upon Mr. Ken Adams. Well, good afternoon. We were, um, as practitioners, uh, asked to consider what issues to address and Nicole Brook and I are going to speak to the issue of quantum. Um, it falls to me to set some context why when we're talking about class actions is it important to focus on the issue of quantum. Surely that's uh, one of the afterthoughts but when one considers that up until about <coughs> 2012 there were 31 shareholder cases and shareholder class actions and 31 had settled <coughs> It becomes quite clear in the operation of these cases that it's critical to get on top of the issue of quantum as soon as we can. And from a client's point of view, uh, it can't come up early enough. Typically, the meetings that we have are that the client's been the subject of a suit and they ask some pretty worthwhile questions. How many people are suing us? We don't know. Um, what's the quality of their claims? We don't know that either. And how much are they suing for? And we don't know that. And it's at that point they start to ask about our expertise and experience in the area. <laughs> but if, from my point of view, it's, it's important to set the context because not all of those things can be known early and not every, everyone wants to know everything as early as they can, but it's not always that easy. But in a class action, it's particularly peculiar uh, and there are features of it that make it especially difficult. The first one I've already alluded to, which is we simply don't know early on how many people are suing a defendant, which creates great tech difficulties for a company, particularly if they're ASX listed entity. And when we're asked to explain when that might be addressed, it's usually in class closure, and we're asked when that will occur, and that's 12 to 18 months after the commencement of the proceedings as a general proposition. So that's, that's a peculiarity of class actions. The second difficulty that the practitioners face in dealing with class actions is trying to deal with the quality of claims, and it's an aspect 
and, it, and if this session is called the future of class acts, it's an aspect that all of us as practitioners have got to grapple with. One would rationally expect that a lead plaintiff would most likely be one of the strongest claimants in the group. That's a rational thing to do. But even assume that's not the case, you would expect there to be a mixed basket of qualities of claims in there. Ideally, as one's advancing a class action, you begin to see the quality of some of these claims teased out. But it almost never happens. There's provision under Section 33Q <coughs> for the appointment of subgroup representatives. I can't recall the last occasion that provision was used. Why? Because it typically carries with it a cost consequence for anyone who wants to be a subgroup representative. We may as well get rid of that cost consequence because what we're not doing is teasing out the different quality of claims that exist amongst the hundreds or thousands of claimants that might be suing. That provision hasn't been used. The provision can be used on the court's own motion, but of course it must appear to the court that there is a different quality of claim and it's almost undetectable from the court's perspective. One device that we've settled on is uh, the, the use of sample group members. And, and contrary to what you might expect, um, sample group members uh, tend not to sample very much at all. Um, their use in Kilmore and in most other proceedings is typically to identify a head of loss that a particular lead plaintiff might not do, but what they don't do is they don't represent a st statistically significant sample of the class, uh, nor do they represent a sample of the quality of the claims that rest amongst the claims. So we're confronted with a difficulty. The first proposition is we don't know how many people we're being sued by, and depending on the nature of the case, quite often we know there are very mixed quality of claims sitting behind the lead plaintiff's claims, but we're, we're rarely able to identify those. Put all of those features to one side. The third proposition that is a unique feature, really, of class actions is we have no idea of the value of the claims. Um, we, we can take pretty crude guesses, but from a boardroom perspective or from an insurance company perspective who have got obligations to reinsurers and boards have got obligation to shareholders, that kind of crude estimation exercise really doesn't stack up. And so from a quantum perspective, it's critical for a practitioner as, as soon as they practically can to be able to answer the question, how much am I being sued for in this case? Now you would think, if you look at part 4A, or if you look at the practice notes in the Supreme and the Federal Court, that they might have something to say about the issue of quantum. And in fact, there's, there's something of a void there. Uh, and it falls really to the judges and the practitioners in any given case to do what they can uh, to work cooperatively. Now they will take different perspectives on that issue, but candidly in the operation of a class action, um, as his honours referred to, it really does fall to the cooperation of the parties to try and get to quantum, the issue of quantum and to try and get some structure and resolution to it. So it's in that context that the, as practitioners, the issue of quantum arises and uh, Brooke and Nicole have agreed to speak from both a plaintiff and defendant's perspectives on how we sort about resolving, not just in the Kilmore case, but, but more generally. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, to use um, Justice Forrest's re Forrest reference from before, I've only recently joined the bushfire class action band, so I'll be talking about um, my experience from other matters mostly today. Um, the main point that I want to make is that evidence and assessment of quantum exist on a continuum um, from zero information, which is no one knows anything about the um, class-wide damages, to complete information, by which I mean um, the sum of individual judicial determinations of quantum following individual issues hearings after comprehensive particularisation and evidence of each claim. It's kind of the Armageddon scenario that you have, you run a common issues trial and then each of your group members lines up and runs an individual issues trial. Um, which, as you can imagine, is very time-consuming and expensive. So they're the two uh, poles. 
The information required to enable the parties to settle a class action involves a cost-benefit analysis, balancing the need for certainty against the cost and delay involved in some perfection of um, assessment. And also taking into account the opt-out nature of representative proceedings, which means that group members may not be aware of the proceeding and the composition of the group may be unknown. And I appreciate that gives rise to the kinds of um, uh, difficulties that Ken referred to in advising his clients. But that's um, what the regime permits. That analysis of um, what information is required to assess quantum and when and how it should be done takes place in a highly charged context in which the plaintiffs want to maximise the assessment and defendants want to minimise it. It's generally not the case that the parties are collaborating in a neutral fact-finding exercise. Uh, so my point is all of these considerations need to be taken into account in working out how to assess quantum um, and when and using what information. So to elaborate on that point, um, as with any litigation, plaintiffs and their lawyers work out at the beginning how much a class action might be worth roughly. Um, they're big, difficult cases and we're not going to run them unless we're satisfied that there's quantum there that is um, recoverable. The loss claim of the plaintiff is usually the subject of evidence in the proceeding with a view to having that claim determined as part of the initial trial. Undertaking extensive quantum analysis for individual group members um, may not be warranted during the progress of the litigation. And I want to just draw on an example here from my experience in cartel cases. In a cartel action, even once you've made a global assessment of what you think the overcharge might have been that was caused by the cartel, to assess class-wide damages, you need to multiply that by um, the expenditure of each claimant um, on the affected product. Defendants ask us for a very granular detail about who bought what, when, and how much it was, and um, the like as though that can be um, generated at the push of a button, but most of these claimants are individuals or small businesses. I can recount many stories as a junior lawyer of uh, crawling over pallets of dusty boxes to locate individual invoices for purchases of vitamins so that they could be um, dusted off, scanned, um, and entered into spreadsheets. It's an enormously time-consuming um, process, and I accept that claimants need to prove and verify their claims in order to get damages. It's just a matter of when you do this, and is it really necessary for everyone to um, undertake this process? In any event, it may be preferable to defer this assessment until after the common issues trial or, or um, at some further point, rather than um, invest in that process um, very early on in the litigation. However, for the purpose of mediation, all the parties need figures and information from which to talk sensibly about compromise. From the plaintiff's perspective, information is required to enable the plaintiff to provide instructions to the lead claim claimant um, about whether to accept any proposed settlement, and also we need to make a recommendation to the court about whether the settlement's fair or reasonable. What keeps us awake at night is whether or not there's enough money in there, and we need to know that. And I accept and um, entirely agree that defendants need that information as well so that they can advise their clients. I want them to know it's a good claim and that it's worth a lot of money, so they'll go and get instructions <coughs> on that. If it's not a good claim, I want to know that too so I can manage the client's expectations um, and make strategic calls about how to progress the litigation. One mechanism for assisting to assess class-wide quantum is class closure, for example, requiring claimants to register <coughs> by a particular date in order to participate in any settlement. Plaintiff lawyers have different views about this. There's no requirement to close the class. Some people prefer to maintain an open class um, because it, has a, it, give, it gives you leverage over the other side. This is enormous potential case. Um, my own preference is um, for class closure on proper notice to group members. I'd rather focus on producing an outcome for a finite class of engaged and committed group members than pursuing what might be unquantifiable damages for an open class of hypothetical claimants. Different mechanisms apply for quantifying damages in different kinds of cases, but a common consideration is what information might be exchanged to assist the parties to approach agreement on quantum. It's hard to talk about the various issues which arise in detail because they arise in the context of confidential without prejudice communications but I can make the following general observations. We should remember that these issues do not arise in a neutral context. Defendants have an interest in getting rid of the class action, and if they can't get rid of it, minimising damages and knocking out claimants. Plaintiffs want to maximise recovery. <clears throat> I have no problem with group members producing relevant, appropriate and necessary information and documents for the purpose of facilitating quantification and mediation. 
where the group has been in some way confined and group members are readily identifiable. No one really has grappled with what to do when the class isn't closed um, and, and it's very, very hard to estimate quantum. I don't hold the view that group member passivity is sacrosanct and I want to be satisfied and I want the defendant and its insurer to be satisfied about what the parameters are, are for loss. What I would caution against is information creep where we move towards a requirement for group members to adopt an open book policy whereby the defendants gain access to all of the group members' documents and communications in order to be in the same information position as the group members' solicitors. We receive requests for information at that level of um, granularity, and I worry about it when I read judgments like Regent Holdings, in which the Court of Appeal said the more accurate and complete the available information as to quantum, the more likely that rational settlements will be achieved. As Justice Beach mentioned before, in class actions all points are taken and I'm concerned about what I perceive to be an insatiable appetite for information about the claims, which takes us too far down the path towards uh, the perfect analysis that um, you get from running a full matter through to judgment, which is not, we're trying to avoid the cost of doing that. Um, this is why I respectfully prefer the wording of Justice Forrest in Power Call, where he stated the particulars provided are not intended to be a work of art and are merely designed to act as a guide to the defendant for it to measure the value of claims that is likely to meet in the event of it being found liable. We sometimes receive requests for information which we do not have or which is very onerous to produce or privileged and or of doubtful relevance to the assessment methodology. For example, we need all of your communications with the class on a particular issue so we can check that your information is correct. Followed by statements that if information is not provided, mediation cannot proceed or very significant discounts must be applied to quantum. Litigation is, is replete with information imbalances, even in these days of active case management and getting to the real issues in dispute. So, for example, we do not receive details of the defendant's insurance coverage. Extraordinary, really, given that um, it's such a significant factor for most parties in mediation and is also a significant factor for plaintiffs. Um, when we go to recommend a settlement to the court, one of the factors the court takes into consideration <coughs> is um, the capacity of the defendants to withstand a greater judgment. Uh, so I I'm all for the production of information to um, assist um, in settlement discussions. I just don't want that to become the new kind of arsenal for litigation by attrition. Um, I think it just needs to be a sensible exchange of information which will assist the parties to um, approximate loss. One of the advantages of settlement is avoiding the cost and delay of litigating individual damages claims uh, and estimating class-wide damages with sufficient certainty to satisfy the parties and ultimately the court. Um, that a settlement is fair and reasonable while maintaining that advantage is um, a real challenge. Uh, everyone, my name's Nicole Wern and um, as Tim said, I'm one of the partners at Norton Rose Fulbright who was responsible for representing the state parties um, in the bushfire litigation in which various state departments and agencies were involved. I think um, the thing that, in terms of my background, I'm a, a common lawyer, um, and I also do a, a commercial litigation as well in terms of PI claims. Um, the class action litigation is really no different to any other case. All cases are about facts, the law, liability and loss. The problem with class actions, and in class actions we can, we can take instructions about the facts, we can prepare the evidence in relation to our client's defence, we can give advice about li likely outcomes. Um, it's all a matter of scale. The one difference that I struggle with as a practitioner is understanding the value of loss claimed and having confidence around the numbers. I act for defendants, and so as a matter of pragmatism, in a claim worth millions and millions of dollars, my clients want to know what are the costs likely to be incurred, what is the value of the loss, what is our assessment of risk, and the potential liability of them and other defendants in the proceeding. And the most difficult question that we've struggled with is what is the total loss and the likely exposure? In major torts litigation, obtaining access to information is a frustrating exercise and it can be affected by the personality and who is acting for the parties. Um, as I said, it has to be understood that a class action is no different from any other proceeding. The board of a company 
or an insurance company standing behind the defendant needs to be able to justify a payment in settlement of the claim to its stakeholders. There are potentially numerous stakeholders who need to sign off on an offer of settlement. The defendant's directors, the legal liability insurer, the excess market insurers, the reinsurers of the primary and the excess market insurers, and depending on the size of the claim, even the reinsurers of the reinsurers. And all of those companies are ultimately answerable to their boards and the boards to their shareholders. And their obligations will not permit them to engage in authorising payments of large sums of money without sound legal advice based on proper foundations. So as a lawyer providing advice on what is a reasonable settlement, ultimately I'm answerable to numerous stakeholders and I need to have a level of confidence about the numbers for my recommendation to be soundly based. And importantly, I also don't want to expose my, my firm and myself to its own suit for professional negligence. The practical challenge can be different depending on whether the class is open or closed, as Brooke said. The Supreme Court Act obviously contains powers which enables the court to close the class of claimants. However, courts and plaintiffs, in my experience, are reluctant to do this early in the proceeding because the allegations in the pleading may still be developing and new causes of actions uh, may result, which expands the class. So getting to the point of class closure takes time. In my experience, defendants are pushing for class closure to happen earlier and the courts appear to be a bit more willing to make those orders. Nowadays, we're also seeing a trend with um, our opt-out system um, moving towards an opt-in system, at least for the purposes of settlement. So at a point in time, the court will say, um, if you want to participate in this settlement, then you need to register. And if you don't register, you won't be participating in the settlement without the leave of the court. At that registration date, the parties at least know how many people want to be part of the settlement. And that's generally a pretty good indicator of how many people are in the class. But knowing the number of claimants is just step one. In class actions, you may be dealing with different categories of loss, and Ken spoke about that earlier. In the bushfire class actions, we've dealt with personal injury loss, dependency claims, property loss, consequential loss, and the plaintiff would say pure economic loss, but the defendants would take a different view on that. So in terms of property loss, we could see someone who has lost a motor vehicle, uh, someone who lost their home, someone who lost their home and contents, uh, someone who had some damaged clothing fighting a fire, farmers who lost fences and animals, damage to gardens. Uh, but we had relatively little information about how many people suffered each of those types of loss. Um, we were assisted by the uh, VBRC, so the Royal Commission at least did have a look at some of this, but you're not going to have that in every class action. Um, we also had access to the bushfire um, construction authority, reconstruction authorities reports, which were useful as well. But they were very high level. And that's not totally reliable. And it's certainly not totally reliable if you want to make recommendations in terms of settlement. On the personal injury front, as I said, we were dealing with dependency claims, physical injuries and psychiatric injury. Again, we knew how many people had died. But as to how many people were injured, that was not known. Um, there would be a reasonable indication in terms of physical injuries, uh, but people suffered psychiatric trauma as a result of these fires and the events that happened, and that was potentially a very significant number of people. So some lawyers will work with you um, understanding, as Brooke said, that it's as much in the plaintiff's interest to understand the total loss as it is to the defendant's. I have experience of lawyers who will agree a joint strategy on how we're going to select a random sample of group members, assess their loss, exchange our own assessments as between one another, and the then sat down and discuss why we reached figures on, on particular um, individuals. And then using that information to extrapolate it across the class to come up with a top line figure from which we can then discount on the basis of the risks as each party sees them. I also have experience of other lawyers who are um, not properly funded or they don't want to incur large assessment costs up front and they'll confine their investigations to the plaintiff. 
and they think that that's a piece of strategy that they can hold over the defendants and it's the defendants' problem. My own view is that this is pretty foolhardy conduct. It means that the plaintiff cannot even assess whether an offer of settlement is reasonable and it makes mediation frustrating and providing advice to stakeholders impossible. We've settled one matter on the basis that if at the end of the assessment process um, there's money left over in the pool, it's to come back to the defendants. Now, that was a matter where we were unable to say, here's a lump sum and the matter's done. We said, here's a lump sum, now we're going to assess everyone. We're going to each have a view about that. We're then going to resolve each one individually and if there's any money left over, it'll come back to the defendants. And in that case, there's going to be a large sum of money that's coming back to the defendants, which shows that there was no real understanding of the losses at the time of the settlement um, and that the values hadn't been properly attributed or understood. I think that our judges are very much alive to these problems and they're certainly open to facilitating the, prog the progression of assessment of lost material. We're seeing a lot of support from the bench in encouraging the exchange of information, whilst being mindful of the fact that the plaintiff ought not be forced to incur costs that she doesn't need to. I think nowadays, though, where we see a greater involvement of litigation funders and law firms funding litigation, where they have a vested financial interest in the, in the outcome, that we are seeing an improved level of exchange of information. But I do think, however, there is more to be done and that it could be better. You might want to comment further, Ken. I now call on Ross Ray, who said very little during the trial, but what was said was very important. So even though he won't say a lot now, it will be very important. <laughs> that template continued. As Tim, you would well know, it's quality, not quantum or volume. Um, I'd just like to highlight a couple of things flowing on particularly from what was said by Justice Beach. We're custom, accustomed to practice in, in an adversary system where usually you have two sides uh, of the contest and it's uh, appearing before an impartial person. The adversary system works extremely well because it tests the validity of arguments. Um, the overarching purpose has been placed before you uh, this morning. Uh, I won't go there. The judicial powers are set out in section 47. I won't go through those again, but they're strong, they're clear, and they're helpful. Expert witnesses ordinarily uh, proceed in a setting where they receive a briefing from those who wish to elicit their opinion, materials provided to them, assumptions are provided to them upon which they can rely. They are provided with questions to be answered and they have the Expert Witness Code of Conduct and the Civil Procedure Act. Let's uh, move on then to work very quickly with what occurs and can occur in a multiple party action and of course particularly a class action. This of course is theoretical. Uh, let's assume 10 expert witnesses relating to three separate conclaves in pursuit of three separate headings of inquiry. Each expert will have already provided, as Justice Beach has touched upon, separate reports or report. They've participated in conclaves and in circumstances where, of course, the lawyers are quarantined or they are quarantined from the lawyers. And that's a, a mutual period of excitement while you wonder what's going on. Um, you've got then an outcome, a joint report, that lists points of agreement, points of disagreement and points of no comment. Again, useful for future cross-examination. The evidence at the trial, that occurs, uh, and our example, we had 42 trial questions within 10 topics set by the court in consultation with the parties. Each expert made an opening address. That's a little scary, but as a practitioner used to controlling uh, what's going on, controlling the evidence, each expert made an opening, each expert uh, provided their evidence in chief, all on a topic basis. So all experts were dealt with uh, in relevant evidence in relation to a topic sequentially. Each expert can then be cross-examined by the party impacted by that evidence. They can be cross-examined by each other. Um, that was a very interesting process and there's not time to go into that in great detail. Each expert could then make a closing address. And of course the process is uh, coordinated and controlled by the trial judge. Um, 
What's the impact of that? His honour Justice Beach, as uh, is his want, particularly given his commercial background, used the euphemistic phrase that's a bit trickier for practitioners. Uh, trickier is not a phrase I would use sitting there and watching this process. Uh, ordinarily, advocates will rely upon a case concept. It will rely, they will rely upon pleadings and issues, thorough preparation, the leading of evidence, specifically relevant evidence, and the use of cross-examination. And of course, uh, as you know, Tim, no question is asked unless it promotes your case or attacks the opponent's case. It's all achieved through preparation and control. The joint witness sessions uh, that we've referred to <coughs> present very little opportunity for the party's advocate to control the evidence. It creates a new burden for practitioners, uh, including not just the decision to call a witness, but the selection of the right witness. I'm not suggesting, of course, that, they, uh, that personality will dominate, but you have to be aware of the process where you're preparing for common questions, preparing and anticipating issues that will be uh, led before the court, and aware that your expert may need to deal with issues outside your intended scope and without your control and without your input. Uh, what it does do is to potentially elevate the role of the expert to that of the advocate without the control, and of course I don't mean control, I mean assistance and guidance of counsel. Uh, what we have, no matter what you call it, is the injection of an inquisitorial component in an adversary trial. Is it of greater assistance to the court? It probably is. Uh, that's an answer perhaps that Justice Forrest could offer a view on. Uh, in my opinion, it was helpful to collate the evidence uh, on a topic basis. In many other ways, did it save time? It may have. Um, it may not have. Sometimes that is a variable that depends upon the nature and quality and the ability of uh, those asking the questions and the extent of the preparation and the focus. But what it uh, has done is to introduce another dimension that we as practitioners have to monitor and prepare for in the course of a case. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I know you'd like to ask questions, but you're not going to get the opportunity because of time, but there's no need to. His Honour has published about 50 rulings, and with his <laughs> brothers and sisters, they come to about 55. If you go and read those rulings in relation to class actions, you'll have expertise in duty, breach, pleadings, procedure, discovery and evidence, and you'll get a high distinction in the Civil Procedure Act. I'd like you to thank the members of the panel. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all of our speakers. We have a small gift for each of you. We're going to have bottles of wine, but unfortunately, after what's happened in New South Wales with certain public officials, we thought we'd better have book vouchers instead. Thank you very much again. Please note the next two sessions. One session 6A is in this room. The, section, uh, this, the next session 6B, litigation funding in the future, is upstairs. Uh, please make your way on. You'll be guided to the next room. Thank you very much.